we're now going to do two short calculations um, engaging with the sample mean. In particular, we're going to look at the expectation of the sample mean and the variance of the sample mean. For the first calculation, we are going to show that the expectation of the sample mean is the population mean. In particular here, we're imagining we have n iid, identically distributed independent draws, from some distribution f. This is a distribution on real numbers. So to show this, we're going to show um, two pieces. The first thing we're going to show is that the expectation of the sum of two random variables is the sum of their expectations. Um, and the next, we're going to show that the expectation of a random variable scaled by a constant is that constant times the expectation of the random variable. And then we're going to put these two together to show that the expectation of the sample mean is the population mean. All right, so for this first piece, we are going to show that the expectation of the sum of these two random variables is the sum of their expectations. So to do this, we write out the expectation of the sum as a double integral um, over the range of x1 and then the range of x2 of x1 plus x2 times the density, the joint density of x1 and x2. I'm imagining these have continuous distributions. If they were discrete, um, this, a very similar calculation would hold with the sum. Um, dx1, dx2. So now what we're going to do, I'm going to switch to a blue pen for a second, is we are just going to distribute um, this piece here over x1 and x2, and then note that um, integral is a linear operator, so we can break up the integral of the sum into the sum of integrals. So um, we can write this, and I'm going to not include the, the bounds of integration from negative infinity to infinity anymore. Um, just we can remember that that is always what they are. x1, p, x1, x2. And here, actually, I'm going to switch the order of integration. And since the bounds of integration don't, the bounds don't depend on, on each other, we can, we can simply do this. Um, and we'll see why this is important in a second. And then the second term looks very similar to the first. And so again, we have two essentially identical looking terms, except the role of x1 and x2 are, are switched. So now we have to remember a little fact. Um, and that fact is that the integral um, say from negative infinity to infinity of p x1 x2 d x2. Here x1 is fixed and we are integrating only with respect to x2 that this is going to be equal to just the marginal density of x1. So this is sort of like saying um, what's the probability that x1 is a fixed value, little x1, and x2 is anything? Well, that's just the marginal probability that x1 is that value, little x1. And the same holds for x2. So the next thing we're going to do so that we can use this fact is we are going to take x1 here. Note that, that this inner integral is with respect to x2, so x1 can come out. And similarly here, we're going to take x2. Note that the inner integral is with respect to x1. So x2 can come out. So we're going to go back to our original color and we're going to say, okay, so this is equal to the integral of x1. Um, and now, well, I'll write this out in two steps. It's the integral p x1, x2, dx2, dx1. And maybe I'll add parentheses to make things clear. Plus, then a very similar term for that second integral. And in fact, let's just write it out. Plus the integral x2, integral p x1, x2, dx1, dx2. And so now this first thing is just the integral x1 times its density, dx1, plus the integral of x2 times its density, dx2. I should really write this as like p2x2 and p1x1. 
Um, and so this is just going to be the expectation then of x1 plus the expectation of x2. And this is then complete. All right, so now for the second result, we're aiming to show that the expectation of a scalar times a random variable is just that scalar times the expectation of the random variable. So we can write this as this expectation of c times x1, we can say is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of, and again, I'm going to use little x1 as my index vector. So c little x1 times p, the density of little x1, little x1, d little x1. Um, and now we know, um, because the integral is a linear operator, that we can just take that c out. So this is c integral from negative infinity to infinity of x1 px1 dx1, which is just c times the expectation of x1. All right, now we aim to combine those two facts to show that the expectation of the sample mean is the population mean. So how are we going to do this? We're just going to write out what the expectation of x bar n actually is. So this is the expectation of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi. Um, and we know we can move the 1 over n out. That was that second fact we just showed. This is the expectation of the sum i equals 1 to n of xi. And before we showed that the expectation of the sum of two random variables is the sum of their expectation, one could use an inductive argument to show that the same is true for any finite, or you could show it for um, a countably infinite number of random variables, but induction would do it for a finite number of random variables. So we can say, all right, so that is equal to 1 over n. Let's take the sum out, i equals 1 to n, of the expectation of xi. Oh, and all of these have that same expectation, expectation under f of x. So then this is now equal to 1 over n, there are n of them, so times n, times expectation under f of x. Right? These are going to cancel, and we're just going to get that this is that expectation that we claimed it would be. All right, now for the next result, we want to show that the variance of the sample mean of n IID observations looks like the variance of a single observation divided by the total number of observations n, right? And this was critical for showing that the sample means um, mass gathers at its expectation, right? That we have that concentration. So to do this, we are going to show that the variance of the sum of two independent random variables is the sum of their variances. This is only true for independent random variables. And that the variance of a scalar times a random variable is that scalar squared times the variance of the random variable. So we now show that the variance of the sum of two independent random variables is the sum of their variance. To start, we are going to let, say, um, mu equal the expectation or be defined as the expectation under f of x. And we could define a mu for x1 and a mu for x2. In this case, they both have the same mean, so we're just going to write that as, as mu. So let's write out the variance of, of x1 plus x2. Well, the mean of x1 plus x2 is, is mu plus mu. So this variance, right, variance of x1 plus x2, this is going to be the expectation of this random variable, right, x1 plus x2 minus its mean, which is mu plus mu, that quantity squared. And now we can distribute terms, and we'll see that we can sort of break this up into two pieces. So we're going to look at x1 minus mu plus x2 minus mu. And right now I'm just gathering terms. I'm not going to do anything beyond that. And now we can just foil this. We can just square this where we think of this sort of as term a and this is term b. And we know that a plus b squared is a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. And we're also going to use the fact that the expectation is linear. So we can break up the expectation of the sum of things into the sum of those expectations. 
So what we're going to get here is we're going to get that this is equal to the expectation of a squared. So that's going to be x1 minus mu squared plus b squared, which is going to be, or expectation of b squared, x2 minus mu squared plus the expectation of 2 times a times b, which is 2 times the expectation of a times b. So plus 2 times the expectation of x1 minus mu, x2 minus mu. All right, so this first term, this is just the variance of x1. This second term, this is just the variance of x2. This third term would be 2 times the covariance of the two of them. Um, I mean, it is that. And in the case that x1 and x2 were not independent, there would be some contribution from this term. However, because x1 and x2 were independent, that means x1 minus mu and x2 minus mu were also independent. And the expectation of the product of independent things is equal to the product of the expectation of independent things. So we can write this as expectation of x1 minus mu times the expectation of x2 minus mu. And in fact, since the mean of x1 is mu and the mean of x2 is mu, both of these are zero, which means this term goes away, which means we have our result. We're now going to show that the variance of a scalar times a random variable is that scalar squared times the variance of the random variable. So the variance of c times x1 is equal to the expectation of c x1 minus its mean, which we know is c times the expectation of x1. We worked that out with linearity of expectation squared. Right? And now we see we can actually factor a c out of both of these and end up with a c squared here. So this is equal to the expectation of c squared times x1 minus the expectation of x1 squared. And now we know this is just a constant so we can move it outside of the expectation. So this is c squared times the expectation of x1 minus its mean the quantity squared. And this is now just by definition c squared times the variance of x1. All right, now we're going to put those two facts together to show that the variance of the sample mean looks like the variance of a single observation divided by the number of terms in the sample mean. So we can do this directly. So the variance of the sample mean, I'm just going to write out as the variance of plugging in 1 over n times the sum over the n observations of xi. And this, we know we can pull out that 1 over n as a 1 over n squared. This is from one of those previous facts we proved. And still have the sum i equals 1 to n of xi. For the next piece, we saw that for independent observations, the variance of the sum of two random variables is the sum of the variances. And that by induction, you can show extends to n random variables. And again, these are independent, which is very important. Otherwise, we would have covariance terms. So this is going to look like 1 over n squared times the sum, i equals 1 to n, of the variance of xi. Now, each of those variances is sigma squared, and there are n of them. So this is going to be 1 over n squared times n sigma squared, which is going to be sigma squared over n. And that completes our result.